Last week, New York Mayor Eric Adams unveiled his $98 billion spending plan. The proposed budget slashes the city's homeless service agency from around $2.8 billion to $2.15 billion. Friday, Adams launched his subway safety plan in an effort to move the homeless living in the city's subways. The plan has social service and health agencies working with the police to enforce violations like sleeping in a subway car. Agencies would then pursue mandatory outpatient treatment for people with mental illness. However, after the crackdown was announced, a weekend of violence on the subways ensued. At least six people were reportedly stabbed in separate incidents on the subway in a 48-hour period. And this year, the NYPD has recorded a 35% uptick in subway stabbings. Transit data released Sunday shows crimes underground are up by more than 100 compared to the same time last year, which presents an issue for the mayor who has called on workers to return to the city with the promise of safer conditions. Public defender at the Legal Aid Society, Eliami Aluren, and policy director at the Conservative Partnership Institute, Rachel Bovard, are here with us to discuss. Welcome to you both. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. So, Eliami, you know, what the city obviously cannot allow people to be routinely stabbed on the subway, to have it be like a literally unsafe way. Uh, to get to work. So I, I think there's probably a lot of bipartisan desire in fixing this absolutely un, you know, unallowable problem. Um, you know, what do you what do you make of how the mayor is handling this? Well, first of all, people are not routinely stabbed on the subway. People are riding the subway all day, every day in New York City in six events of quote unquote stabbing does not amount to it being routine. But before Eric Adams even officially took office, he began this fair mongering campaign about the crime, the homeless and the subways. And he never really addresses any root causes of crime or gives a full picture view. When he describes the subway like this lawless, dangerous place, he always fails to mention that NYPD has 35,000 officers, at least 4,000 of which are already committed to the subways. When he starts using these individual events of crimes in the subway, he never mentions the many police that were present and when these incidents occurred, yet the incidents occurred anyway. Is it a coincidence that New York City has a significant homeless problem and some of the highest rent prices across the country, an incredibly difficult to even access housing market with the many guarantor requirements, New York City landlords asking for months of already high rent up front, broker's fees, low wages, high taxes in the most segregated schools in the country? Is it a coincidence that the vast number of these stabbing events began with people looking and asking for money? Is it a coincidence that New York City has a poverty-related crime when the Department of Homelessness Services budget is $2.8 billion, but NYPD's budget is $10.3 billion? Is it a coincidence that Eric Adams, a former transit cop, has made the subject, has made the subways the subject of all his ire? And I think, is it a coincidence that he proposed a $375 million cut to the homeless servicemen's budget, a uh, $615 million cut to the education budget, but isn't touching the NYPD's $10.3 billion budget, but wants us to believe that he'll now deploy even more resources for the homeless? So they couldn't solve the homelessness problem before, but now they'll be able to with $615 million less to do it. If we continue to give less and less resources to the poor, we're going to see more and more problems related to the poor. Or is it simply that people like Eric Adams wish to see the homeless less? I think this is an issue. We can't take less, take more and more money from the homeless while recognizing how they ended up homeless. They're homeless because they're poor. These people don't have resources. And if we couldn't address the problem before, how are we going to do it with less money? And so, yeah, Mayor... Mayor Adams' team uh, has planned would also add extra outreach teams, he's calling them, new drop-in centers, and, quote, increase availability of nearly 500 safe haven and stabilization beds. These are accommodations intended for street homeless New Yorkers that provide more privacy and feature fewer restrictions than congregate shelters. And he said he'll have those out at some point this year. In brief remarks Friday, Department of Social Services Commissioner Gary Jenkins said the safe havens and stabilization spaces were, quote, new beds, but he didn't provide specifics. So, uh, Rachel, how, how do you, how does, how does Adams justify, you know, slashing, you know, significantly slashing the budget for social services here uh, while then expecting the problem to kind of work itself out with, with cops kind of, you know, sh I guess, shooing people off of subways and eventually into these 500 kind of new stabilization beds, but no timetable for that. So I don't think it's as clear as, as cops shuffling people off of subways because I, 
I agree. I don't think that solves the perpetual problem that New York City is facing. It does seem from his plan that he will have health care workers and social workers alongside some of those cops to try to get some of these homeless people into you know beds, into psychiatric care. And on the issue of slashing funds, a lot of those funds are being slashed actually at the federal level. Some of that is just COVID relief that is not being renewed uh, to the tune, I think, of $500 million and doesn't reflect, I think, some of the state money that's coming in alongside New York City's money. So Governor Kathy Hochul announced a $30 million statewide effort um, yesterday to sort of expand psychiatric facilities, um, some specific to New York, I think 500 additional beds in New York, and an additional effort to recruit psych- uh, psychiatric help throughout the state. Because I think that's a lot of the underlying cause for at least some of the homelessness, right? When you look at the supportive housing effort, which I think is actually a good effort, right? Which seeks to actually take people off the streets, treat them and get them into permanent housing. A lot of the supportive housing isn't set up to deal with the very mentally ill, and that requires actual psychiatric care. And so to focus on that, I think at least removes some of the people who need help the most from the streets, and then you can begin to address the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, look, $2.8 billion versus $2.15, what are the billions of dollars? They can't, that's baffling to me that the government is so incompetent that they can't fix this problem with to whatever comes after a billion dollars, you can't, you can, and, and I mean, to, and to your point, Alimi, to the armies of police officers that they already have, and they can't, they can't reduce stabbings, they can't have people not sleeping on the subway, they can't have crazy, they can't do anything about the, again, it's not, it's not thousands of crazy people, it's, it's some, it's an, it's a, 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 a troubling number, a, a, a number that, you know, creates all these externalities, but they can't, I don't think they can, they they haven't shown that they can handle the problem no matter how much money they have. Right, and I think we also have to talk about what the, the shelters are actually like. The shelters are not this safe haven from issues or people that are homeless go there and they are devoid of crime or issues. Actually, the shelters themselves are already tend to be at max capacity or overcrowded and the people there are not being subjected to great care. Additionally, 500 beds is not going to solve 500 additional beds at some point in the year and the, the, the homeless shelters is not gonna solve the problem now and it doesn't address what they're doing with the people that they're cracking down on and arresting now. And often what happens at these shelters, and I know this as a public defender is, crime or issues happen, they don't have adequate resources even at the shelters. And what happens is whenever any of the homeless people get into any interactions with each other or the people that work there that are not fully um, facilitated to take care of them or interact with them, have any issues with them, what do they do? They call the police. They call the police and the people at the shelters are arrested. And then what happens is they issue orders of protection against the homeless people, against in favor of the other homeless people, and now they can't be in the shelter system. So now you have someone, right. homeless people, ready with criminal cases and out of even the shelter options. So, and, and many of, them, many of them don't want to be there anyway, or they're on drugs, so they're, they don't, they want to do drugs, and then you can't, it's prevented, or the police get called at the shelter, so they're not going to stay there. So this, I don't know, it, like, uh, what, what do you think, Rachel? I, I don't think, what, what will more money do? There, like, there's not a will to handle this problem. You can't, uh, apparently you can't, you know, coerce people to take the antipsychotic medicine that they need, that sort of thing. So this is just going to be something that's going to frustrate us, I guess forever, but that's very unsatisfying. Well, I think one of the interesting things that caught, caught my eye when I was looking into the story was that, you know, Eric Adams is getting critiqued for slashing, I think, 131 positions within, you know, the system that were actually never filled. And you have to ask yourself why, like why, to your point about why this isn't addressed regardless of how much money we throw at it. Well, why? Is it a bureaucratic problem? You know, what are the layers here that are, are not being implemented effectively? Why were those positions never filled? You know, where's the audit of the system about why this isn't effective in the first place? And so I think that's a question that has to be asked because there's obviously many factors that go into this, right? It's not just getting people off the streets. You know, it's treating them so they don't return. It's, you know, for the most mentally ill, it is actually getting them access to psychiatric care as opposed to just sort of public housing. And so all of that, I think, has to be assessed before we just sort of fling money at a problem and say, oh, it's going to go away now. Right. And, and psychiatric care, of course, is necessary. But if you go back to what uh, Alimi was saying about the cost of rent and the, the need for several months up front, uh, the, the need for a, a broker's fee. It's like it, it's practically impossible for anybody to get an apartment, even if you have a full-time job and, and you have all of your mental faculties together. And so, exactly. uh, Eliami, if, if all of a sudden Eric Adams uh, called you up and said, I saw you on Rising, you clearly have your finger <laughs> on the pulse of what this problem is, uh, what do I need to do? How do I, 
How do I begin to turn this around? What would you what would you tell them? If we really talk about what homelessness in, is in New York City, I think we have to stop framing it as though the homeless are this um, special population of people that are different than regular New Yorkers, as opposed to regular New Yorkers that end up in a bind. Recently, they just found a homeless woman in New York City in Long Island um, had been like dead, literally died, was on a subway, um, fell asleep dead. They turns out she was like a former real estate broker like four years ago and would been laid off and lost her home. And now that's a homeless person. We have to talk about what it costs to live in New York City. I'm an attorney. I'm on here with you all on the rising. I am 28. I have a basement apartment and I barely have that. OK, we have to talk about making resources more available and making this an affordable place to live because if people can't afford to live the slightest hiccup and now they're on the street. And that is reality in New York because there are places I've lived in places like Ohio, lived in places like West Virginia. You can get another apartment at the drop of a hat. You can show them your bank statement, show, you have, show them you have a job, not New York City. New York City wants months and months of rent. They want a broker's fee. They want to put you through a lot of a hurdle. And a lot of people simply don't have those resources in New York City. So what they need to do is make housing more available in the first place, make more affordable housing. It shouldn't be that people can't afford to get studio apartments, that people have to live in basements. That's how we ended up with things like when we had the flood and people lost, completely lost their homes because so many people in New York City live below ground. So the first thing they need to do is make the conditions more tenable for people in New York City to afford to live here, and you're going to see less of those collateral consequences like homelessness. Oh, Rachel, uh, we'll give you the last word. I don't dispute at all the notion that there's like layers and layers to this problem, um, particularly the availability of public housing. You know, I hear a lot of businesses are fleeing New York these days. Maybe we can turn those high rise uh, corporate offices into some public housing. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Occup <laughs> Occupy downtown. I like it. Yeah, no one should live in that accursed city. Is my <laughs> or just abandon the city? <laughs> New York was a mistake. Uh, Alimi, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye. We'll be back with more rising right after this.